Okay, well, again, as I said, I'd like to thank Jeff and Dave and the other members of the board for inviting me to speak today. Uh, one of the problems I always have when I'm speaking before an audience is I have so much information to present. I often find that uh, when, I'm, <clears throat> when the speech is over with, I always worry about I'm, I'm going to be in the same situation as the minister who went to the um, newspaper editor on Monday and said, I want to thank you for that write-up you gave me about your sermon, about the sermon I gave you yesterday, but I do have one question. Why did you replace reverend with never in. <laughs> I had one person one time give me an introduction. I was going to speak at, uh, I can't remember exactly where it was, but I know it was so grandiloquent and magnificent. The time she was old with, I felt like the man who was in the grave had uh, poked his head up and read his epitaph and said, uh, <laughs> either somebody's lying or I'm in the wrong hole. <laughs> um, I specialize in critiquing the Bible. I expose its errors, contradictions, and fallacies. You know, people are hearing all the pros and none of the cons, and all you have to do is turn on the radio and television to see that. We're virtually inundated with things uh, that are totally one-sided. People have a right to hear the other side. If they still want to believe the Bible, I have no problem with that. But they do have a right to know what's wrong with the book. I teach a kind of Sunday school in reverse. I tell them all the things they should have heard in Sunday school but didn't. And believe you me, there is a mountain of information along that line. Uh, certainly ministers, priests, and rabbis aren't going to do this. That's not what they're paid for. Their task is to give one side and one side only. And I feel that a thorough analysis of the Bible is long overdue. And, uh, you know, people who support the Bible always say the Bible has the answer, the Bible has the answer. I say, excellent, excellent. It has the answers. I have the questions. Let me give you some of the problems with the Bible. I have so many that I hardly know where to begin. It's always a challenge when I speak. Where do I, what do I put in and what do I take out? I might, as I might state at the beginning, I am a chapter and verse man. I stay almost entirely within Scripture. Now, why do I do that? I find if you go outside the Bible and you bring information to the Bible, people are going to simply say, well, I don't care what you have. If it says the Bible's wrong, it's wrong. I have the Word of God, the perfect Word. You don't. I do. Therefore, uh, when I go outside the Bible... I find that uh, I don't get anywhere. So I stay within the book. I don't have something outside the Bible saying the Bible is false. I have the Bible saying the Bible is false. One of the things I love about the Bible is the book is horribly repetitious. Uh, Deuteronomy repeats Exodus. Uh, Proverbs are very repetitious. Chronicles repeats Samuel and uh, Kings. Uh, the Gospels are repetitious. And all this repeating, it constantly gets its stories out of sequence, out of order. It's discombobulated, to be perfectly frank. And this repetition works to my benefit. And a lot of the problems I present, it doesn't take a college professor to realize you've got a problem on your hands. Let me give you some examples. John 14:6. <clears throat> says, and this is Jesus speaking, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now, if you have to have Jesus to be saved, and that's what this verse is saying, what do you do about the fetuses that die in the womb? What do you do about babies that die at a very young age? What do you do about people who live in the New World before missionaries arrived? What do you do about somebody who lived to be 90 years old but never attained an IQ of more than 10? There's absolutely no way these people would accept Jesus. But it says you have to have Jesus to be saved. 